Now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today, Drs. Gary Pope and Moshe Delshad. Dr. Pope received his BS in chemical engineering from Oklahoma State University and his PhD in chemical engineering from Rice University and currently holds the Texaco Centennial Chair in Petroleum Engineering. His research interests are in the areas of enhanced oil recovery, geological storage of CO2, reservoir simulation, natural gas engineering, such as stimulation of blocked gas wells, and petrophysics, such as new three-phase relative permeability measurements and models. Current EOR research includes development and experimental testing of new surfactants and models for chemical EOR, development and applications of the UT Chem and UT Comp simulators, and development of new hybrid EOR processes for heavy oils. Current research on GSC includes optimization of CO2 EOR and the development of novel approaches such as coupled energy production and storage in geopressured geothermal aquifers. Dr. Del Shad received her PhD in petroleum engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. She is currently a research professor at PGE and teaches fundamentals of enhanced oil recovery there. Her research focuses on developing mechanistic numerical models for gas and chemical enhanced oil recovery processes in sandstone and fractured carbonate reservoirs, including large scale reservoir simulation and application of such processes. The research area includes the development of a reservoir simulator for CO2 injection in saline aquifers and history matching of existing field demonstrations. She was named a distinguished member of SBE in 2014. With those introductions complete, I'm going to turn it over to Gary and Mojda to tell us to get us started on our webinar. Hello, uh, I'm Gary Pope, and it's my pleasure to give you a whirlwind introduction here to chemical EOR methods. Okay, all right. First, I would like to uh, mention the fact that we have 34 sponsors of our chemical EOR research at the University of Texas in the Center for Petroleum Geosystems Engineering. And you can see the logos here of those sponsors. So obviously there have been many people, many students and, other, and others, professors uh, involved in this uh, program. I won't go into those details, but uh, you can find more of it on the web. OK, so first, what is chemical EOR? Uh, excuse me, I'm a cold. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, methods are listed here. I'm not going to name all of them. I'm going to focus on uh, a few of them. Uh, Dr. Dale showed will, will, will uh, follow up and focus on, on more of those and, and, and uh, other aspects of, of the uh, technology. Uh, but one of the good things about Kimigui are, are there are many different approaches uh, for different circumstances. So why chemical EOR? Uh, first of all, it's evolving and getting better with uh, time due to innovations and experience. Uh, it's a very versatile technology. Uh, the cost of the chemicals has decreased by a factor of at least two relative to the price of crude oil, uh, while at the same time the quality of the chemicals has improved. Uh, just compared uh, to, say, the last 10 years when the price of crude oil went up, the price of chemicals actually went down. Uh, they're relatively insensitive to the price of crude oil, uh, but they're cheaper now than they were, say, 30 years ago. Uh, for example, a, a pound of polymer or a pound of surfactant costs uh, less now in, in real terms than it did uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, also, uh, an uh, exciting development are uh, hybrid processes, uh, such as low tension gas flooding uh, and <coughs> uh, surfactants combined with heat for, for viscous or heavy oils, uh, polymers uh, combined with smart water or low sal, uh, gravity stable surfactant floods, just to mention a few. So the big question is where to use it. Uh, well, geology is always important. Favorable geology is uh, necessary. And, and that's indicated, first of all, by good water flood performance. Water flood performs well, then that's a good indication. Uh, but also, we highly recommend, even though we won't talk about it today, inner well tracers, single well tracers, and, and other reservoir characterization to make sure that the uh, target is appropriate. The other thing is uh, high porosity and permeability. I haven't given an absolute cutoff on this. Uh, I do have a screening slide. But uh, economically, the higher, the, the better. Now, of course, 
it's technically feasible to, to say, uh, do some of these processes in low permeability. But the good targets are the ones that are higher permeability. Uh, now, in terms of oil viscosity, the number keeps going up for polymer flooding. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our new process called alkali co-solvent polymer flooding, ACP. Uh, used to say a few hundred centipoids and a few thousand. Now it's uh, being done commercially up to at least 10,000 centipoids. On the other hand, for the surfactant-based processes, such as surfactant polymer flooding and ASP, uh, unless you uh, use uh, heat or some other method, uh, the limitation is a few hundred centipoids. Uh, if you do use heat with the more viscous oils, then hot water is an option. Electrical heating is an option for the really heavy oil. Uh, in terms of the uh, chemicals themselves, uh, we pushed the limit up to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the salinities are almost unlimited up to about 250,000 parts per million. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this table. I, 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 uh, you can look at it if you want later on. But it's, it's a rough guide. And, it, uh, and I stress the fact it's just a rough guide of uh, selecting uh, the processes that might be uh, worth studying or looking into more, doing lab studies or simulation studies. Uh, <clears throat> there are things that aren't on this slide, though, that, that are decisive, such as uh, do you have a supply of CO2? It takes a very huge quantity. Uh, if the answer to that question is no, then even if the other conditions are suitable, uh, it may be uh, more uh, practical to look at a chemical UR alternative. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, again, the, the, these uh, numbers uh, don't necessarily mean that these are uh, always the right uh, or the best places, but it's a starting point. Now, let's start first with polymer flooding. It's the simplest. A process. Uh, it's a commercial process uh, used worldwide. In fact, uh, there, there's probably about as much uh, oil being recovered from polymer floods around the world now as, as all of the CO2 floods. Uh, the primary objective of uh, polymer flooding is to provide better uh, displacement and volumetric sweep efficiencies uh, during a water flood. <clears throat> uh, so. Uh, in all cases, due to the heterogeneity of the reservoirs, uh, the volumetric sweep is important. Uh, in the cases where the oil is viscous, in this example, it's 80 centipoids, the microscopic sweep efficiency uh, may be the dominant effect and certainly is an important effect. And that a lot of that, I'm not going to go into the theory, but a lot of that can be captured by fractional flow theory. There may also, in some cases, there is also in some cases, uh, a reduction of the uh, residual oil saturation due to the uh, viscoelasticity of the polymers. So these effects uh, are still under study. Uh, depends on the circumstances. Uh, but certainly, uh, you do get a lower remaining oil saturation with polymer compared to water flood. Some of the uh, recent uh, polymer flooding advances are the uh, fact that the quality of the polymers have increased. The most widely used one, of course, is the commercial hydrolyzed polyacrylamide. Uh, that gives much better injectivity in both vertical and horizontal wells. Uh, the polymers are available over a very wide range of molecular weight, up to at least 20 million, which is uh, very helpful. You can tailor it to some extent to the rock. Uh, higher molecular weight for higher perm, lower molecular weight for low perm. Uh, the equipment procedures for field preparation of high-quality polymer solutions are now routine. Uh, water softening is now inexpensive in some cases. Uh, for example, maybe as low as 15 cents per barrel of seawater when done on a commercial scale. Uh, and this e enables the use of these polymers at even higher temperature and uh, even harder brine and so forth, uh, or higher salinity, I meant. Uh, and then there are new polymers that can be used uh, in hard, hard brine at uh, high temperature, even if the water isn't softened. Uh, now, just to summarize on polymer flooding, uh, increasing the water viscosity by adding the polymer to the water helps minimize the adverse effects of reservoir heterogeneity and will benefit almost all water floods, even if the oil viscosity is low. But of course, the benefit is even higher with more viscous oil. Uh, the benefits are greatest when the polymer is injected at high concentration for a long time, for example, more than 1 4 volume. This is an extremely important point, and perhaps the most important point I want to make. 
This is analogous to steam and steam drives and CO2 floods and other miscible floods. Uh, what we have found out over the past uh, decades uh, in commercial practice is you just have to keep injecting it for a long time. And even uh, after a long time, the incremental benefit is still significant. So one of the most common mistakes is simply not putting in enough, uh, too low a polymer concentration or too uh, small of a polymer slope. Uh, under favorable conditions, when done uh, right, and uh, the polymer cost is uh, only in the range of about one to five dollars per barrel of additional oil. So there are additional costs, of course, operating costs. But the um, this this is just a rough indication of the price of the polymer uh, by itself. Many projects, commercial projects, large projects, have been reported though where the total costs are in the seven eight dollars per barrel range, uh, incremental over water flooding. Uh, that's that's a pretty good deal even at today's prices. Now let's switch to uh, surfactant methods. <clears throat> The objective of the surfactant polymer, alkaline surfactant polymer, and alkaline co-solvent polymer flooding is to recover the oil remaining after water flooding by mobilizing the oil trapped in the pores due to capillary forces. In other words, the true residual oil saturation. Now, these processes can also help in other ways, uh, improve the sweep, for example, because of the polymer. But the main target is the residual oil saturation because we're lowering the interfacial tension. Now, we have to lower it a lot, uh, maybe as much as 10,000 uh, Fold, and that takes a really good surfactant tailored specifically to the uh, oil and the reservoir conditions. In the case of ACP, we're not actually adding any surfactant. We're adding alkali. It's reacting with the crude, forming soap, and reducing interfacial tensions. That makes it a really interesting process uh, at lower cost for more viscous oils that are uh, active that have a high acid number. Uh, and then adding uh, high molecular weight polymer to any of these mixtures uh, increases the sweep, but also uh, vastly improves the oil recovery. There are very few cases where uh, these processes, surfactant methods, work well uh, without polymer. Uh, I'm just showing an example here of a, of a really good laboratory uh, study that we did a few years ago, where <clears throat> this is a viscous oil, it's 100 centipoise oil, 30% uh, of a pore volume ASP slug followed by polymer. Uh, only three tenths percent surfactant. The reason, uh, or one of the reasons, this works so well is because it wasn't active oil. There was alkali being used. It produced soap, so it didn't take very much surfactant. Surfactant retention was essentially zero, almost zero, because of the alkali and other uh, conditions. The little inset there is to remind you that uh, the, the technology requires uh, a lot of expertise, a lot of care, a lot of uh, quality control. at all times for this to get these kind of results. The other thing I wanted to point out real quick is that notice that the oil cut there in the tertiary oil bank is over 80 percent. And that is an amazing because we've completely uh, watered out this core. There's, there's watered out this core. There's, there's, we're at residual oil. There's no more oil coming out. And then we hit it with this surfactant slug. And wow, here we get 80 percent oil cut. Uh, and in a, a recent uh, field test that was done, that no shots going. Uh, I apologize. Apparently, there was an audio problem. Let's uh, let's start here on uh, and recap uh, polymer flood advances, and then we'll go from there. So uh, very quickly, uh, the quality of the polymers have increased, uh, improved tremendously. Uh, they are available in over a wider range of higher molecular weights. Uh, equipment and procedures for the field preparation uh, are now routine. Uh, in some cases, water softening is an option at very low cost, and we get uh, more viscosity and can use the polymers at an even higher temperature. Uh, and then there are new polymers that I don't have time to go into, but can be used to, in hard brine at high, at high temperature. So uh, just to recap, to summarize on polymer flooding, uh, by adding the polymer, we uh, minimize the effects of the reservoir heterogeneity, which is always there and always important. Um, and, and that's true even at low viscosity, oil viscosity. But as the oil viscosity increases, we get additional benefit of the microscopic sweep efficiency and the, the lower remaining oil saturation, even in the swept zone. 
Uh, the benefits are the greatest when the polymer is injected at high concentration for a long time, more than one pore volume. That's uh, all of our experience with polymer flooding, CO2 flooding, steam drives uh, over the last uh, 30 years has shown that consistently. Uh, you have to just keep injecting the CO2 for a long, long time. You have to keep injecting the steam for a long, long time. And it's the same with polymer. You just have to keep injecting it for a long time. It's a mistake to uh, use just a fractional pore volume uh, slow. And under favorable conditions, when it's done that way, uh, the range is amazingly, the, the cost is amazingly low, uh, about a dollar to five dollars per barrel of additional oil. And of course, there are other costs associated with the operation, but they're incrementally not very high. So we, there are many commercial projects that where the operators have reported numbers as low as seven, eight dollars per barrel of, of additional oil. That's not too bad, even under the current oil price environment. Okay. Now let's switch to uh, surfactant methods. Uh, the main objective of these methods is to recover the residual oil saturation. We have to lower the interface with tension, uh, about 10,000 fold to do that. That means the surfactant has to be tailored to particular oil and the reservoir conditions. Uh, we know how to do that really well now. Uh, in the case of the ACP process, uh, we're not even adding any surfactant, but the alkali reacts with the oil and form soap and makes it uh, very attractive when it works because uh, for certain types of oil, active oils with high acid number, because we're not adding any surfactant at all, so it lowers the cost. And then the, uh, we still need the high molecular weight polymer. Okay, here's an example of a, a ASP slug displacing a viscous oil with uh, tremendous results. This course has been uh, completely watered out where residual oil, the oil cut zero, and then, then uh, the slug is injected and uh, the oil cut goes up, clean oil with no chemical, um, running ahead of the chemical, uh, more than 80% uh, oil cut. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, why is this possible? Well, first of all, uh, new surfactants and new co-solvents have been developed, uh, particularly here at the University of Texas. Uh, several classes of high-performance surfactants uh, and, and co-solvents that are uh, mixed in with the surfactant. Uh, wide range of molecular weights used to be 400, now it's up to 4,000. Uh, that's because of, uh, so the new surfactants uh, have larger hydrophobes. Uh, adding inexpensive ethylene oxide and propylene oxide to improve the salinity and hardness uh, tolerance, and it also makes the molecules less expensive. The carboxylates are, are new and, and uh, have been found to be stable up to at least 250 degrees F. Uh, degrees F. Uh, we often mix them with uh, sulfonates that are also stable up to those temperatures, very high temperatures. Uh, the, all of these are made from commercial feedstocks. They're all uh, inexpensive, uh, two, two and a half dollars per pound. Uh, we've learned how to make synergistic mixtures. That means we add two or three of them and they add a little co-solvent and the mixture works much better than any pure component. And they hang together, they don't separate. And, and so uh, all of these things have uh, made it a, a sea change from uh, even just 10 years ago. Now, the real key, though, here to making economic is low surfactant retention. We know that these surfactants work really well. We know we can recover the oil. We know that they don't cost very much. But the, but the uh, other requirement, the basic requirement, the most important thing I want to emphasize is the fact that the retention has to be low. In other words, uh, the cost of the process is directly proportional to how much uh, surfactant absorbs or is retained in the, in the rock, in the reservoir. Okay. And there are two ways that that happens, the adsorption, which everybody thinks about and talks about and measures. But the other one is phase trapping due to viscous emulsion. So we've worked hard on that. And we found out in many cases it's the largest contribution to surfactant retention. So lowering the emulsion viscosity results in lower retention and lower cost and makes the process economic. So, um, <clears throat> So, so what we've done is, in recent years, we've reduced it by a factor of about three, uh, which is a tremendous achievement. It's a difference between being cost-effective and not cost-effective. The alkali feather reduces it by a factor of about two, but it requires soft water, but it usually pays for itself. Now, in, in sandstones, uh, even with high clay content, that means we're looking at values in the range of 0 0.02, 0 0.11 milligrams per gram of rock, and that's, uh, that's amazingly low. I'm going to talk about the historical numbers at the very end. And, but to get these good results, a good mobility control or polymer is still essential. Now, 
one of the ways we've been uh, able to do that uh, is with uh, better co-solvents. Uh, here you see a conventional co-solvent uh, being used um, <clears throat> in the viscosity. And uh, with no co-solvent at all, it's up there in the uh, 80, 90 centipoise range. Uh, that's too high. Uh, with a conventional co-solvent, uh, it's been reduced uh, more than a factor of two, uh, but it's still uh, higher than what we would like. On the next slide, you'll see uh, with a new co-solvent, uh, we're seeing very low uh, microemulsion viscosities, and this new co-solvent in this case is the phenol 4 eo And that's what we want and that's what we need. Uh, where we get it down to maybe only two or three uh, times the viscosity of the oil. On the right the inset there, lower right, you'll see we also uh, improved our modeling capability, and Dr. Dale Shaw will sort of talk some about that in terms of being able to model these effects. Uh, this is just one of many examples we've run uh, with very low retention. This one's 0.075 in a sandstone with about 12% clay because that ratio, the micromolecular viscosity, was only about twice the oil viscosity. And you can also see here that the chemicals came out. They came out without separating. We got a nice oil bank, and uh, th so this is the kind of results we're getting with these new uh, chemicals. <clears throat> uh, here's another example, uh, again, uh, showing uh, very good results. This one doesn't uh, have a co-solvent in it, but it's got a nusofactin in it, the EHS, uh, that's doing the same thing. So let's, let's wrap this up by uh, looking at the economics and infinites of reduced retention. So back in 1990s, 1993, for example, uh, there are many papers, I've cited just one of them here, uh, a typical number was 0.4 milligrams per gram. So if we put in 1.78, or that was particular uh, experiment was 1.78% of the uh, active surfactant, this just as a fact by itself would cost $18.21. By, by 2008, <laughs> Um, that had been reduced a factor of two. That means uh, the same thing could be accomplished with 0.88% uh, surfactant, reducing the cost to not about $9. Currently, uh, we're getting uh, typical numbers uh, of, of around 0.08 milligrams per gram of rock, which means that 0.36% surfactant would accomplish the same thing. And now we're only looking at $3.64 per barrel of incremental oil or additional oil. And that uh, looks interesting even at today's price. Um, I'm going to show one last oil recovery core flood experiment here because this is was done uh, before uh, it was applied in the field. This is one of our patented surfactants, uh, tristyrophenol uh, EOPO sulfate mixed with an alkyl benzene sulfonate. This was a live oil core flood done at 1,700 PSI uh, in the sand. And you see the uh, oil bank came out, a clean oil bank came out at 70-80% uh, oil cut, uh, no problems with emulsions uh, and so on, uh, almost 100% recovery, the final oil saturation down to uh, about 1%. Uh, amazingly, uh, when this was done in the field, uh, the results were almost the same. In other words, the, there was an oil bank formed, 70-80% uh, clean oil, uh, no problems with emulsions and so on. And Dr. Tilshaw's going to talk a little bit about more about that Mongolian pilot uh, in her presentation. So uh, let's see. We better wrap up here. Um, take home. Uh, the combined impact of all of this new chemical oil and oil field technology is a game changer. The new and better chemicals at lower real cost, increased performance at lower cost per barrel of oil, new hybrid methods for both light and heavy oil, better models, which Dr. Dilshad is going to talk about. I haven't touched on those because she will, uh, to design and predict the uh, field performance. Uh, better enabling technologies, that's a big deal, by the way. Uh, I haven't talked about them, but the horizontal wells and so on, combined with the uh, improved chemical technology, is uh, synergistic. But it's still complex technology, and geology still matters, and so do people. And by that, I mean uh, 
the great thing, this is great technology, but it, uh, it's complicated and, and requires uh, lots of measurements and good models and good engineering, and good reservoir engineering, good implementation, good quality control and so forth. That means uh, experts are in it. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, for the next very short 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the recent development uh, UTCAM uh, for the hybrid methods that Professor Pope talked about. So a lot of times what we do, depending on what is done in the laboratory or some of the ideas, we try them with the simulation and then it may uh, proceed to further studies in the lab. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of these methods and technologies. Uh, so again, we're talking about the University of Texas chemical flooding simulator that came Actually, the first version of it, it was a one-dimensional code that came with Dr. Pope from Shell. And since then, since 1977, at least you know, a couple of hundred uh, graduate students, postdocs, research staff, they've been working on further development of this code. And our mission has been really the same since then. Try to develop mechanistic models for chemical EOR processes for different scales from laboratory to the field. And recently, because of the expansion of chemical EUR to more challenging reservoir and fluid conditions, for example, effect of geochemistry, we're emphasizing more on making sure we're modeling these processes more accurately. For example, when you're injecting the alkali solution, raising pH in a carbonate reservoir, you may actually provoke some sort of reactions with the rock and within the fluids. And also low salinity water flood has something to do with the geochemistry and cation exchange. So we're emphasizing these um, methods and models and try to improve them uh, as we go along. And also including some of the um, hybrid methods when you combine two mature technologies to reduce the cost and make the process more robust and uh, more, of course, cost effective. Uh, for example, we've been looking at using surfactants or alkali uh, for mixed with fractured carbonates, looking at the altering readability of the matrix. And then we added the capability in UTCAM. Uh, low salinity or smart water, and then you combine it with polymer, it becomes low sal polymer, and may have great you know, cost uh, potential if you combine these two technologies. Uh, when you get to more viscous oil, you may want to raise the temperature of water and do a hot water surfactant polymer flood, and you may benefit from that significantly. You can use foam, uh, so you need gas and surfactant to generate in situ foam if you cannot inject polymer. And I mentioned some cases that if you have low permeability, you may not be able to uh, inject polymer because of the loss of injectivity, so you replace uh, polymer with foam for mobility control. And that also may lead to a, a hybrid method of actually doing surfactant flooding for ultra-low interfacial tension combined with gas uh, for more uh, mobility control and also gas flooding and other part of the reservoir. So uh, with, these, uh, with this introduction, I'll just highlight some of the applications of UTCAM in uh, laboratory studies and also field studies. We have the capability of doing tracer testing uh, for single well, inner well tests, and uh, polymer flooding, of course, quite a bit of emphasis on including viscoelastic polymer and the impact on uh, microscopic displacement efficiency Professor Pope talked about. Talking about polymer degradation mechanisms, of course, you want to avoid them uh, in the field projects, but we have the capability to predict if there is a degradation, uh, what is the impact? A uh, lot of numerical simulators, because of the um, numerical technique and the size of the grid you usually use, you uh, underpredict the injectivity of polymer. And it's really crucial to make sure that you predict the injection rate of the polymer accurately. Otherwise, it will have really big impact on the results of your numerical models. So we spend quite a bit of time on trying to improve the injectivity even if you use very coarse grids for field scale applications. And of course, UTCAM has been traditionally a surfactant polymer model, so we have very mechanistic, comprehensive uh, formulation for the phase behavior. 
uh, alkali surfactant polymer flooding with the geochemical reaction models and polymer gel as uh, conformance control methods uh, using readability alteration models with surfactants and alkali, low salinity water flood and smart water in carbonates, microbial enhancer recovery, which requires some biological reaction models, which we do have, uh, combining the heat and chemical flood. And you can do this with the steam flood, electrical heating to just heat up the reservoir, lower the viscosity of the oil, and then benefit from the chemical flood much more and hot water injection. You can also model the low tension gas flooding. So that includes the modeling of the gas in UTCAM with the solution gas, of course, and modeling the foam. And we have multiple um, options for foam modeling. So now I'm going to mention some of these hybrid methods and then some examples of the simulations that we've done for these cases. So these are the heavy oil applications of chemical EUR. Uh, this is one uh, field case that is a viscous oil, about 1,500 centipoids oil, with a strong aquifer support. That the strong aquifer support that the client, the company, wanted us to do some UT chem simulations to help them decide where to drill the injector uh, for this field. And of course, we set up the numerical model based on the information uh, coming from the company, uh, assigning proper properties of the aquifer and the reservoir. So this is an example of uh, the case where we drill the injector right at the water oil contact, which they usually do, either right at water oil contact or below the water oil contact for water flooding. But this may not be the optimum position for polymer flooding. And the producer was multilateral, uh, and uh, basically on the right-hand side figure gives you the uh, location of the producer. And this is one case that we injected polymer with the injector right at the oil water contact. And you see the viscosity of the water that has been increased and also shows quite a bit of loss of polymer to the aquifer. So uh, this is not a very optimum uh, position for the well. So we moved the well uh, above the water oil contact and you see there is an optimum position uh, that you get the highest recovery if you're about 10 feet above the water oil contact. You may lose a little bit of the oil, but the still uh, the loss of polymer is going to be minimized to the aquifer. And uh, of course, if you go further up, uh, above the water oil contact, then the recovery goes down because now you lose too much oil. And the effect of viscosity we also looked at is very important, and the position of the well you put in, it really depends on the viscosity of the oil, and the recovery is a function of that. So this is two sensitivity cases that we ran for this uh, offshore uh, reservoir. Uh, if you lo uh, lower the viscosity of the oil to 300 centipoise, then you get you know, almost four times uh, higher recovery than the more viscous oil. Uh, the next uh, hybrid method is alkali co-solvent polymer. So this is a new technology developed at the university by uh, Professor Pope and uh, Dr. Upali Versuria. And this is a method that you uh, basically add co-solvent to alkali polymer. So then you don't need any synthetic surfactant to be added. It lowers interfacial tension. You have good mobility control because of polymer, and it gives you lower viscosity emulsion. So it's very uh, good process, low cost for active oil. So you have to be able to produce enough soap for this process to work. We've done uh, quite a number of experiments for a range of oil viscosities, and we modeled most of these experiments. Uh, and for viscosity from 70 to 4,800 centipoids, and you see the recoveries are in the range of 80 to 95 percent uh, OIP without any need for synthetic surfactant. And then uh, we used uh, one of these cases for a field project uh, that they were planning to do a pilot in South America. And uh, they've already started polymer flooding, and then they wanted to look into the ACP uh, process. And this is one of our simulations we did for this field. Uh, the left-hand figure gives you the oil saturation at the beginning of the project. And then the right-hand side figure gives you the oil saturation after the ACP, which was injected for only about a tenth of a pore volume. A very cost-effective, and you see the major reduction in the oil saturation after this process. 
Then I like to talk a little bit about the uh, viscoelastic polymers and uh, possibility that these polymers can uh, reduce the remaining oil saturation to the water. And that's a topic of research uh, on porous scale, laboratory scale, and field scale. Many groups are looking at it because the impact might be uh, significant. Uh, so we added the capability to UTCAM based on the DEBRA number and changing the remaining oil saturation to the water as a function of DEBRA number. And DEBRA number basically gives you the relaxation time of the polymer and some characteristic time of the polymer. So uh, we basically started with this concept. And then, of course, there were so many experiments they did at UT for different oil viscosities uh, and different conditions, secondary, tertiary mode. And we simulated all of those with this concept of DEBRA number. And this is one example of the uh, sand pack with the 250 centipoise oil. It shows the water flood, and we match the experiment very nicely. And with the polymer flood, uh, that showed 24% reduction in the remaining oil saturation to the water. So again, that can be a significant reduction if it can be scaled to the field. We uh, did quite a bit of studies on how to improve the polymer injectivity. And I'm just showing you one of the validation we did for some of the ideas that we implemented in UTCAM. Uh, you know, many times you use very coarse grit on the order of maybe 300 feet or larger when you do field scale simulations. And that may smear uh, the shear rate calculation for the polymer and the dependency of the viscosity of polymer on shear rate, so then you get really wrong results. So we set up a radial model as a true solution with about one foot uh, grid versus a Cartesian grid with a 77 feet uh, size, you know, grid blocks. And then we looked at different injectivity correction models that we've added to UTCAM. So this is a case that you're running a constant rate polymer injection and we're monitoring the wellbore pressure. If you do not do any correction and just use the model as is, you will get much higher uh, pressure uh, for the injection well. Whereas if you do the uh, corrections with either effective skin or the analytical model, you get very close to the radial solution, which is really the true solution. And here we're talking about almost the 500, 600 PSI pressure difference. So that what that means is like if you're relying on your numerical model with coarse grid, you will not be able to inject the polymer at that rate, and you have to cut back the rate, you know, erroneously. So that's the uh, significance of this. And of course, a lot of times for heavy oil, you're dealing with unstable polymer floods. When you get to the viscosities uh, on the order of a couple of hundred to thousand centipoise, you cannot afford to inject polymer with that viscosity. So you, in you increase the viscosity of the water, but still the mobility ratio is less than, uh, is greater than one, so it's unstable. And we are trying to do very fine uh, grid simulations of uh, unstable displacements with polymer and surfactant and try to develop um, techniques to upscale this to larger scales because you cannot afford to use this kind of grids when you go to the field scale uh, projects. And uh, this is just showing you the fingers. Uh, for these cases, we're using 20 centipoise polymer for different oil viscosity. So they're all unstable, mobility ratio greater than one. And you see more and more fingers are forming and they're becoming longer as you have uh, more unstable displacement. So this is something we're focusing on uh, these days for unstable flats. The last uh, technique is the low tension surfactant gas flooding. And this is very similar to surfactant polymer or ASP, but now you're using gas instead of polymer. And this can be a really great application for the cases that you have very high salinity, high temperature, maybe polymer is not a good candidate. Or you have injectivity limitation with polymer in tight formations, naturally fractured reservoirs or very viscous oil. So then uh, you generating foam in situ by having gas and surfactant, and that will be your uh, mobility control. And then you use surfactant for ultra-low interfacial tension and mobilizing the residual oil. So this process requires two different surfactants. One that will reduce the IFD, or it can also change the wettability. The other one is for foam generation, and they, have, they may have 
two diff you know different properties, so we need to model them accurately in UTCAM with two different surfactant and mixing rules. Uh, this is one example, and we've done more of these cases uh, comparing our simulations with the experimental data, and you see that we were able to match the pressure gradient and recoveries and so on, including this very uh, complex process of gas, foam, and uh, surfactant phase behavior. And uh, you can also do a gravity stable displacement with the surfactant, and this also has a great potential for the cases that you cannot use polymer or you cannot use even gas. So then you can rely on horizontal wells that will give you very good volumetric sweep, and um, you want to make sure that you do the injection under uh, a velocity that is going to make the flood stable. Uh, and the reservoir uh, heterogeneity and characteristics become very important in this process because you need to have enough uh, vertical flow uh, for the surfactant solution to migrate upward and produce the oil. Uh, so, and there are a lot of uh, reservoirs around the world that can be good uh, candidate for this process. So this is one example that uh, they did uh, gravity stable surfactant flood in a fractured carbonate. Uh, very low matrix permeability, and they created a fracture for this reservoir core, and uh, you see that the recovery is actually pretty good, about 50% uh, recovery, and we were able to simulate this uh, process uh, with UTCAM. And the way we do it, uh, we assign a very, very high uh, Dijkstra-Parsons coefficient, so we generated the uh, geostatistical permeability uh, with a huge contrast in permeability to mimic the fractures, mimic the rugs that they were in this uh, core and some microfractures. And uh, we were able to uh, simulate this experiment uh, that way with this uh, heterogeneous case. And then uh, this is another case that they were trying to do a lot of experiments in uh, Professor Pope's uh, lab, trying to understand uh, what should be the velocity, the critical velocity for having a stable displacement. And uh, at the end of the, these experiments, the key information was actually coming from the phase behavior, coming from the phase behavior and the microemulsion viscosity. So the microemulsion viscosity was a controlling factor, making sure that is low enough, you'd be able to achieve good velocity to do these kind of floods. And uh, the students, they simulated these experiments looking at different grids, and you see that you have very nice, you're capturing the fingers, for example, for this specific experiment when you do uh, enough fine grid uh, simulations. So I have two more slides, uh, just giving you a very quick overview of two field projects that uh, university was involved, uh, both in the laboratory side and also the simulation using UTCAM. Uh, the first one was the uh, polymer and ASP pilot in Mangala field in India. This is a 19 centipoise oil, 27 API, uh, very good permeability porosity. This is sandstone, 62 C temperature. And the formulation was developed at UT with very uh, small concentration of surfactant, 0.3%. And it was one of the IPs, the TSB uh, surfactant that is developed at UT. And the results of this pilot actually is going to be published uh, at the Tulsa meeting. Uh, they was actually the results of pilot was so similar to the core flood results. The oil cut up about 80%, no problems with the emulsion. And the company was very excited about this uh, field project. They've already started the commercial polymer flood and they are planning for a larger ASP pilot in this field because of very, very good results of their pilot. And the next one is the ASP that is going to be done as a, a five-spot pattern uh, in 2017 in Kuwait. And this is a very thick, heterogeneous carbonate reservoir, Sabria Madud, with permeability on the order of 1 to 100 millidarcy and about 70, 80 degrees C. The ASP formulation was developed at UT using one of the IPs, the carboxylate with two other surfactants and using sodium carbonate uh, in a carbonate uh, reservoir. Uh, these are the results of the single well test 
that they did and they injected the ASB uh, in conjunction with the tracer test to see the uh, change in the oil saturation uh, after ASB is injected. And we used UTCAM to actually redesign the, a the, the way that single well tracer test is done in these type of formations, which is unconfined. So uh, the simulations uh, led to changing the way that uh, the second tracer test is done rather than in the water, you need to continue injecting polymer to get a comparable sweep efficiency before and after. And the images here, they show that if you do inject the second tracer in the water, you get more larger sweep efficiency versus if you do it in the polymer. And you want to be consistent in terms of the uh, sweep efficiency for surfactant and polymer. With uh, the single well test, and there were four of them done in Kuwait, uh, the saturation was changed by about 34 percent saturation unit when the ASB was injected and that corresponds to about 85 percent recovery of the residual oil so very successful and as I mentioned they're going to do a multi-well pattern a pilot in 2017 in this formation and that this concludes my talk okay well, we're going to uh, open it up for questions right now I've already see, received quite a few and um, you can continue to um, ask those questions. I probably won't get to all of them, but uh, I'm going to start with a question for Gary, um, which is uh, um, someone asked, um, it, well, you mentioned using high polymer concentrations, and, and that's generally ideal. Uh, they pointed out some cases where maybe a low polymer concentration worked well, for example, in the Middle East. Are there any instances where you would recommend a low polymer concentration, and in, in what cases? Yes, uh, the, the <clears throat> low polymer concentration has been successful, and it, it depends on the characteristics of the oil and, and many other variables. And really, what you want to do is uh, do a, a careful lab study and a careful simulation study, uh, mechanistic simulation such as uh, was just described by Dr. Delshad. But if you do inject lower uh, concentration, uh, the, there is some absorption, some retention of the polymer. So that means you're going to have to inject it for a longer period of time just to satisfy that requirement. Uh, but having said that, the bulk of the evidence and over the decades, and there have been hundreds and hundreds of uh, commercial polymer floods, uh, is that you get more bang for your buck at higher concentration. Uh, they work better. They're more robust. Uh, you make more money. Uh, so I think the burden of proof is to uh, show that you don't need the high concentration because the empirical evidence, the field evidence, is very, very strong that, that you benefit from higher concentration. Okay, we have a, uh, another question. This one's going to be for Mojda. Um, was, well, actually, there are several questions about uh, what you TCAM can and cannot model. Um, one of them being, uh, can you TCAM model Nano emulsion that you are, um, i.e., not kinetically, sta uh, kinetically stable emulsions, not micro emulsions. I, you know, it's basically uh, again whatever we do in terms of the modeling, we are is going to be driven by what is important in the field, and uh, definitely we have some other mechanism in UTCAM that there are uh, kinetics, and we don't, you know, make the assumption of uh, thermal equilibrium, you know, uh, there. Uh, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. So that, uh, we might be able to handle that maybe in the future. Okay, I have another uh, question for Gary, which is uh, wondering if you could comment on the feasibility of using surfactant flooding in more unconventional formations, for example, mud rocks or highly shaly sandstones. I think that that's a, uh, there's potential there. It's in the research stage. Uh, I, I don't think it's a proven technology yet. This would be <clears throat> an example where uh, making use of uh, the surfactants that uh, imbibe and change the wettability uh, have some potential. But, but it's not mature technology like the other ones that we were talking about in the conventional uh, sandstones and carbonates. Uh, so... <clears throat> um, I, I would say uh, it would depend on uh, doing some very careful lab studies and so forth before we, that would be ready to, to, to apply in the field. 
Okay, I have another question about UT Chem for, for MOSDA. Um, and actually, I'm going to combine a few questions here and, and maybe throw in one of my own. So uh, one of the questions was, uh, can UT Chem model flow thickening in a polymer flood? Uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to answer that uh, for MOSDA because um, I know for a fact that she's actually developed a model that does flow thicken, thickening. Um, and it's been incorporated into UT Chem for quite some time. Uh, there are other questions about um, the Deborah number. One of the questions I have is it looks like you have an empirical correlation for the uh, residual oil saturation for Deborah number. Um, I'd kind of like to know where, where that came from. And then a, a question um, asked by the audience was uh, how high of a Deborah numbers do we usually observe in the field? Yeah, so it was basically a correlation using the uh, Debra number based on the relaxation time of the polymer, and then we correlated that with the equivalent shear rate. Uh, so then it has a shear rate dependency uh, in the formulation of Debra number. Most of the uh, papers and publications that we've seen, the Debra number can change anywhere from uh, 1 to about 10. Uh, so, and you see in that correlation that we have, we go within that range. And again, it was just mainly an empirical correlation that developed with probably modeled and history match at least, you know, 20 different sand packs with that correlation. Uh, and if we find out more uh, mechanistic way of doing that, we will be happy to. And I know Dr. Wallhoff is doing some core scale. Uh, calculations there, and so we can maybe combine uh, the two research ideas together. Uh, Gary, we have a, a question uh, kind of related to something that we're doing together, I think, which is um, uh, how does one optimize chemical UR in naturally fractured formations? Yeah, good question. Uh, we're seeing some great results now in naturally fractured reservoirs. Actually, Mosde showed one uh, in her presentation in a very heterogeneous, uh, highly fractured regular uh, carbonate. Uh, the <coughs> we're using the same. I oh, apologize. We're using the same methodology actually to tailor the surfactants and to test the surfactants in the laboratory uh, and develop the good effective formulations. Uh, that we're using uh, under the more conventional uh, circumstances. I think there's great potential there uh, to improve the uh, oil recovery. And, and one of the reasons is because there's more target. In other words, the if you just inject water in an oil wet carbonate, you don't get much. And so there's a very high oil saturation there that the surfactants can uh, get. Uh, you, you have to design it a bit differently. Uh, but the results appear to be very uh, promising. Uh, we're in the process now. Dr. Bahoff and I have a student that's uh, doing a series of core floods with. Uh, uh, another question about uh, UT Chem's capabilities. Uh, can UT Chem model steam surfactant co injection in horizontal wells? Yes, this is a capability that we've added. Uh, actually, Dr. Sepanuri's group. Uh, to UT Chem, and there are at least you know two or three SPE publications on it. So electrical heating to generate steam, steam flooding, all of those are now they're combined with surfactant floods. Uh, here's a, another question. I don't this uh, probably appropriate for both Gary and Moshe. Uh, are there any noticeable differences in the ultimate recovery factors after any of these tertiary recovery processes between reservoirs that were water flood? flooded versus a strong natural water drive. But it really uh, all depends on uh, how effective your uh, aquifer and the natural uh, water drive is. Because if you do the uh, conventional water flooding, you have really pattern with the wells, and you're going to sweep the reservoir. So you may end up with a lower oil saturation overall than just relying on maybe ineffective water drive. But it really depends on the reservoir case and uh, the aquifer strength and also how effective your water flood has been. But I would say that basically you have lower oil saturation when you go to the tertiary uh, for chemical flood when you have uh, water flooded with the pattern. Uh, there's a question uh, for, for the gas surfactant floods. Is there any pilot or commercial projects 
And if so, what gas are they using to form the foam? Uh, actually, I was in a meeting in a very beautiful place, Cancun in Mexico, and uh, there were mention of uh, at least three pilots in U.S. that they're going to do uh, CO2 and surfactant. So basically, it's going to be surfactant also for ultra-low IFT and surfactant for foam. So it's going to be low-tension uh, CO2 floods, uh, three of them. But... Uh, I'm not aware of any other project that is happening, at least uh, we're not aware of it. But you can use any gas. Actually, you can use nitrogen. It doesn't have to be CO2. So, and it can be CO2 as an emittable uh, gas, uh, hydrocarbon gas. So that process, you can use any gas. And as the simulation and laboratory studies, they show great potential. But I'm not aware of any field project yet. Okay, so it's 1 p.m. I'm sorry if we didn't get to everyone's question. Um, many thanks for attending today's webinar. Uh, please watch your email for, for the next uh, webinar. We'll send more information as soon as the data is set. If you're going to claim CEU credit, don't forget to click on the verification link on the final slide. The webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the CPGE website early next week. Thank you.